All right, it is time for panel two, which is called Fire in the Belly. <laughs> That's why we all have full bellies now, we can have some fire in it. Meeting challenges to autonomy and activism. And your moderator for this session is Anne Firth Murray. She's a New Zealander uh, and founding president of the Global Fund for Women. She teaches on women's health and human rights at Stanford University and is author of From Outrage to Courage, Women Taking Action for Health and Justice and Paradigm Found, Leading and Managing for Positive Change. She draws her activism primarily from the work of grassroots women's groups worldwide. Please welcome Anne Murray. We're going to, going to try to stick to time uh, in this panel. And um, so maybe we won't uh, necessarily have applause until we have a standing ovation at the end or something. I don't know. We, it's up to you people. Anyway, I'm Ann Firth Murray. I'm very, very honored to be here. I'm very honored to have been invited to participate in this birthday party. I like parties, but I especially like um, a party that celebrates an organization as important as our bodies ourselves. So thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate that. And I'm honored to be moderating this panel. Um, I want to just quote from the welcome uh, comments in the, in the little booklet, saying, our bodies ourselves has always been more than just a book. And this important part, it is emblematic of a women's health movement committed to principles of feminism, as well as social, economic, and racial justice for all. We can certainly point to many successes over the past few decades, but we also have new challenges and persistent obstacles that will keep us all busy for some years to come. And as I was speaking with the panelists yesterday and today, I'm very reminded of times at the Global Fund for Women when some of the issues would sometimes get us down. But then in would come the requests and the information from hundreds of women's groups around the world. And we realized that we were not alone in our commitment and our desire for positive change for women. It was tremendously inspiring. And again, I feel the same way about today when we have our partners with us from around the world, and particularly this panel. So thank you all for being with us. We're going to um, speak for each panelist is going to speak for about five minutes, five or six minutes, to talk about what they're doing in their organizations. What are their organizations doing? And I've asked them to be uh, rather personal. What brought them to their commitment to their organization? What was that fire in the belly that uh, caused them to come together with others and create the organizations in their, uh, in their homes, home countries? And um, uh, give their all. We talk about, you know, working night and day and, and um, into the night as Obos people have been doing. And we've all been doing that in the women's movement for so many years. Um, what was that personal drive? What was that personal story, perhaps? And then what are you doing in your organizations? And then we'll come back uh, in uh, the discussion and later to the connection, particularly with uh, Obos. So I'm going to quickly introduce uh, or describe very quickly each of our panelists now. The descriptions are in the program, uh, and I could just say why not read it, but I, I want to highlight um, the um, diverse backgrounds of, of the people on this panel. First is Ragda um, Elna. Elna Bilsi, Bilsi, Bilsi um, who's a trained sex educator, lecturer, and workshop facilitator. She manages projects implemented by Women and Their Bodies, which is the organization that she's associated with, in Arab-Palestinian communities across Israel. And she's the editor of the Arabic adaptation of Our Bodies Ourselves. She has a master's degree in social work from Tel Aviv University and is currently working on her PhD at the School of Social Work at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Next to Ragda is Stanislava Otasevich. Uh, born in Belgrade, Stanislava has been a health and human rights activist for more than 18 years. Among other things, she's co-founded the Women's Health Promotion Center, the organization she's associated with. Co-authored with a, a, a Serbian Our Bodies Ourselves, authored the only manual for health workers in the country, and led a WHO multi-country study on violence. She also serves as an educator and lecturer upon invitation. Irina Todorova. She's a health psychologist and professor at the Center for Population Health and Health Disparities at Northeastern University. 
She's also past president of the European Health Psychology Society and the, that, the representative of that organization to the United Nations. She co-founded the Women's Health Initiative in Bulgaria, which I hope she's going to talk about that organization, which published a Bulgarian adaptation of Our Bodies Ourselves in, excuse me, in 2001. Shamita Das Dasgupta. She is the co-founder of Manavi, a New Jersey-based organization that focuses on violence against South Asian immigrant women and girls. She teaches at New York University Law School and is the author of four books, The Demon Slayers and Other Stories, A Patchwork Shawl, Body Evidence, and Mothers for Sale. And Dana Adele, uh, she's an activist, a scholar, and an artist. She's the director of SPARK, which stands for Sexualization Protest, Action, Resistance, Knowledge. And she's the founding director of VIBE Theater Experience, which is an arts education organization that empowers New York City teenage girls to create original theater about real life issues. She has an MFA, a Master of Fine Arts, in theater directing from uh, Columbia University, and a PhD in education from New York University. So I hope we'll have a relatively informal time, but we're beginning with almost statements, but descriptions of what you're doing and what brought you to it, and then we'll open it up to more discussion among us and I hope the audience. So, Rada. My name is Raghda Nabilsi. It's an Arabic name. Uh, I'm so excited and also so stressed <laughs> <laughs> to be in this place and um, I would like uh, to begin that to say that uh, the Our Bodies Ourselves book on Arabic was a kind of dream for me um, because, um, because of the complicated reality uh, of the Palestinian minority in Israel. And I will explain what I, what I mean. Uh, and because of the socio-cultural and the socio-political uh, context of the Palestinian women in Israel, not only the Palestinian community in, in, in Israel. Uh, and for me to be part of this collective in, uh, in Israel, it really was a dream and uh, uh, a kind of... Uh, um, a big opportunity for me to be uh, in, 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 in this kind of uh, organization. Um, as I said, the, our uh, socio-cultural and socio-political very complicated as a Palestinian minority because after 48, after the establishment uh, of Israel, uh, our Arabic language also, our identity and our uh, culture, uh, we, we, we began to lose it because we, we have to know the Hebrew language. We first also to know this language to exist and to live together with the Jewish people. But in the same time, it's mean, it means that we lost to write and to read in our Arabic, uh, uh, Arabic language. And when we began to think about writing oh, the, the Obus book in Arabic, it's for me was a kind for rebuilding our identity, our culture as a collective and also as a gender minority in our society. Uh, uh, and for me, it, it's big, began to be a, a, a reality. It's, um, uh, it's, it, it's, um, um, uh, and also in the other side, I uh, think to write a book on Arab women about body, uh, health and sexuality is a big challenge. It's a big challenge uh, for in, on my society, on my community, and also being part of uh, a place uh, that it's hard, uh, it's hard for, it's, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I, I'm still so excited. <laughs> um, it's really a challenge uh, uh, in, in, in very traditional and conservative uh, uh, society uh, because it's, uh, because it's attitudes to, to, uh, to women and their status and what, uh, what our community is supposed from us 
uh, to do or how to cope with our sexuality, our body, our rights. Uh, but it's very important to mention that after 48, after the establishment of, of Israel, there is a lot of uh, uh, Palestinian human rights organization and women and, and feminist organization that uh, cope and try to empower uh, the whole uh, society and also the Palestinian women. But we didn't find, we, we didn't, uh, we touched that we don't have enough uh, materials that written in Arabic about these issues. I mean, not only about health, body and sexuality, I mean with its radical and feminist uh, perspective for the rights of the women on their bodies. Because for me, the book is not only about health. For me, it's uh, my right uh, for myself, for my body, for my language, for my uh, 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 choices uh, where I am as a Palestinian, as a woman, as a collective. So uh, uh, that's what I mean, it's uh, a dream. I'm not going to... Um cut you off okay. before, and I'm going to sort of for, force you into talking about yourself. Yeah. In such a difficult context, yeah. you entered, you took leadership. Tell us about that. <laughs> um, I might say that I grew up in uh, a very political and feminist family. My dad and also my mother was part of uh, Tandy. Uh, Tandy, you know what's Tandy? It's the democratic... Uh, um, the women feminist uh, democratic movement in Israel that they were Palestinian and uh, Pal uh, Palestinian and Jewish women that worked together to do change politically and also to change the um, status of women at all and also specifically uh, a Palestinian uh, a woman. That means I have another two days. <laughs> so. <laughs> And so I, I got a lot from my parents and specifically from my mom. And maybe it's that the moment that I can thank her and also I will thank my husband because without them I couldn't do this hard uh, job that take, take 24 four hours of my, of my day to edit the book and you know, to work with another uh, big group. And in spite of I, that I uh, uh, grow in this kind of family, it was really hard to find a place, or uh, um, not only a place, it's uh, uh, materials, uh, um, um, uh, written books in Arabic that's talking about these issues. And despite that my family, my, my mom was very radical in my opinion, it was hard for her to explain for me in Arabic about these issues. I, I remember when uh, at the high school, me and my friends uh, wa was looking, in, uh, looking for Arabic materials about this issue, we didn't find. Maybe there was some in Hebrew, but also also, the Hebrew was so traditional, so conservative, and it was really hard for them. And that reason that I wanted to study as to be a social worker and sex educator. Uh, I studied a sex educator at the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the Arab Forum Sexuality. That all, also there we didn't find any materials talking about sexuality, uh, sex uh, identity about our bodies and what's going and what's happened to us as a, as a Palestinian woman who's living in Israel that is a lot of uh, uh, um, discriminations against us. Okay, I can't stop. Here I, it's before, four or five years ago I was a teenager. I will repeat, I'm Stanislava coming from Serbia, a small country in, East, in Western Balkans, so-called, 
and we, one of the uh, countries uh, came out from the former Yugoslavia. I'm stressing this because I want to say how this fire in the belly came to me. And that's unfortunately come uh, in its all strength during the conflicts in former Yugoslavia and how we started and how we wanted to handle and to manage this problem. Some enthusiastic, the feminist, concentrated in women's groups, uh, saw and faced at once with a, a big injustice and a war all over the former country in which we were used, which we were um, emotionally bounded to. And we realized that enormous quantity of the refugees came to our, con to our country because our country formally or officially wasn't at that time in the war, but nevertheless, we were really in the war. The, the war was not on the territory, but all consequences and all wo uh, war activities were planned in a way on our territory. So we had to do something. A big wave of uh, um, refugees, women, mainly women with their children, came from Bosnia at that time. And we faced this uh, having the many women who were raped. At that time, we were a small organization without any uh, space of ours. So we had to, to yes? Okay, to, to, re, to, to have meetings in the various spaces and we're not uh, um, able enough to, to see all, uh, all uh, what is ahead, but then we really uh, realize that we have to do something because all these women were uh, in, uh, mainly in the hospital waiting to give a birth. And that was out of our philosophy to, uh, to go to the women. We had a, our feministic approach was to wait that women addresses to us. But then we, saw, uh, we realized that we are not, that is too luxurious not to find all these women and to tell them that they are not alone and to try to do something for them. Uh, whatever they decided to do, whether to have the abortion, whether, whether to help them managing in the rest of their lives. So we made first a group for the women raped in war and afterwards we we funded our center, and our center was developing during the time based on this really pu real push to, toward the women, toward the women's health, uh, realizing that the women's health and the women's lives are tightly connected with the social context and the whole en environment, and that is not a medical matter as it was treated before, but an, uh, the, the, this uh, another dimension to their lives we have to know. Uh, uh, we, as the, ed as, as the women who wants to do something and to teach and to educate the women and the general public about the issue as it is, really. And can you say just a minute or so about yourself? A little uh, bit more about you. Okay, about myself. Yes, it was, uh, I, I would like to go a little bit further. I realized that I have something in myself and that I'm dedicated to the women's health at that moment when I started to practice myself and when I worked in a little ambulance uh, in the rural part of my country and when I saw the women coming not and accepting the um, ill health as the way of living and, uh, and when I saw their uh, needs to, to, to change the things but don't know how. 
And that was the start, you know, and <laughs> during the time it developed and I did a lot of things in this. We'll come so. back. We'll have time to talk about okay. Thank you. I'm Irina Todorova, and I um, work in Bulgaria with um, many colleagues and co collaborators in, in Bulgaria. And I um, wanted to talk a little bit about the context because I think that is what um, motivated us and what motivates me to to uh, start that work on women's health, and particularly um, health inequalities, which I think is one of the m main things that we look at and that we try to work with. Um, and the social and political changes that have happened uh, in Eastern Europe, and we're neighbors with Serbia also, uh, and that have been going on for two decades. Actually, one of the uh, critical things that um, that happened and that that's an ongoing issue is that rapidly, there have been rapid, significant, really deterioration of uh, health for all citizens, uh, men, women, children, uh, that happened dramatically in the early 1990s, and that there were so many complicated uh, reasons for that, and we've been, you know, always trying to figure out what the causes are, how they interact, but they're so complicated and intertwined. But, um, uh, and it's been 20 years now, but many of the health indicators are really just now beginning to come back to where they were 20 years ago. So it's really been a long process, a very frustrating process. I think that's, you know, what motivated me is really this, I, I think, anger, really, in, in a way that, in the sense that these things should not have been like that. They shouldn't have deteriorated. Um, mortality shouldn't be so high. There's just, you know, no reasons. Um, and one of the areas that we work in, one of our main projects is, for example, cervical cancer prevention. And I think that's an example that I use and uh, because it's so emblematic. You know, cervical cancer mortality should not be rising rapidly in Eastern Europe where, when it's falling um, everywhere else. And, and there are many other examples like that. Um, and um, so the, the inequality gap is widening, um, and injustices are um, you know, visible everywhere. We also, our organization, our group does uh, a lot of research, and we use research for um, uh, hopefully you know, policy recommendations and influencing policy. Uh, but in that research we and in our other meetings with uh, uh, women and um, in community centers, we hear these stories of um, uh, really quite um, vivid injustices that, um, that have made us, you know, angry and uh, we've uh, tried several approaches and we do you know, there's several a aspects of our work including research advocacy uh, health promotion uh, working with our bodies ourselves in community centers <laughs> thank you and um and and yes so uh i that, that I think that is the main motivation for me, really trying to, and the mission of our organization and why um, I had the idea of founding uh, this organization and uh, collaborating with all our partners is to really aim to reduce or eliminate inequalities within the country, within groups within the country, ethnicities, uh, and also comparing Bulgaria to other countries in the area and reduce inequalities in, in health and uh, particularly women's health. Thank you. Uh, for me, I have been involved in anti-violence against women work for more than 30 years now. And in 1985, uh, 
realizing that our community was not getting any attention or um, we didn't know how women were doing, I was a co-founder of one organization, um, the first one in the United States, focusing on South Asian women. And it's an anti-violence against women um, in the South Asian community. And it's still working. So, um, uh, but what happened was in the last 12 years, I have been spending a lot of time in India, almost every year, about three months. And I started working with two particular organizations, Swayam and Shonglap in Kolkata. That's where um, my home is. Uh, and um, uh, with uh, Shong Shonglap, uh, I started working with in the sex workers and women who are involved in the sex trade, that particular area. And with um, Swayam, I did a lot of research studies on sexual harassment, which is called in India Eve teasing, uh, uh, with younger women. And as I was working with both groups of women, young women in colleges and um, uh, women um, in the, involved in the sex trade at the street level, uh, there was a lot of organizing going on, but I realized at the same time that there was very little knowledge about their own bodies. I mean, uh, in Calcutta, um, the HIV transmission rate has been in, within this, in this, um, among the sex workers is very low. It's about 12% because there's this insistence of organizations like Durbar and a um, few others that have taught them to you know, insist on using condoms. But they didn't have any idea of why they, that was happening, what stopped, what uh, was going on. Uh, and of course, there was this no idea about their own bodies and uh, that there is something else might be happening besides HIV. There are other STDs that uh, they may be getting um, or any kind of. So I just felt that all of these kinds of gaps in information that was among the young women, um, uh, you know, educated women, uh, and also women who were in the rural areas who were illiterate, left them very, very vulnerable to, um, uh, to diseases as well as assaults. And when assaults happened, first of all, it was uh, that when um, they were unable to prevent assault, and when it did happen, they were unable to speak about it because there was a silence that surrounded it. Um, and this was in Bengal only. And I just to give you an idea of what Bengal is like, it's uh, the native tongue of West Bengal, Tripura, and neighboring country of Bangladesh. Uh, it's a very large population. And besides that, nearly 300 million Bengalis are spread all around the world. Most of them are monolingual, or many of them are monolingual, um, which means that they are totally uh, familiar with only their own language, which is Bangla. It's the fourth widely speak spoken language in the world. Uh, and within, and um, as, you know, what was interesting was that sexuality, as I said in the morning, is a completely taboo topic. A mark of a good woman or a virtuous woman is sexual naivete, ignorance about your own body, sex, sexuality, uh, anything that has to do in that, that area. So, uh, and um, it was amazing to me that that was going on still. You know, I'm pretty old, so I was like, uh, thought it has changed, it hadn't. And there's a complete obliteration of information on uh, sex and sexuality from the vernacular. Uh, and this is in a land where Kama Sutra happened at one point of time. <laughs> So uh, sexuality was just gone, it's been wiped out. And what was particularly alarming to me was the prevalence of HIV infection, high rate of trafficking in girls and women, very low age of um, girls going sexual initiation, high child marriage rate, uh, and all of the, and, and the number of women in sex trade, a million women in Calcutta alone are involved in the sex trade. Um, so uh, I just assumed, okay. Um, 
and I just felt that um, uh, this was this was a horrendous situation, and my partner Shang Lap uh, was also, and Swayam also. All of the organizations, by the way, in NGOs in uh, West Bengal and Bangladesh were excited that this would happen, that information would be given. Fortunately, there were very large numbers of. Uh, community workers already working in rural and urban areas and what they said mainly that they didn't <coughs> have information and the pictures they showed or the charts they had those women looked like Western women they weren't our women so people didn't quite get it um, and so and, and I don't know if you've seen one um, picture of Buladi okay Buladi is a very famous character now. Uh, she's the aid prevention person. Everybody knows about, um, uh, you know, before Buladi came around in 2004, I think, about 17% people in Bengal knew about HIV AIDS. Buladi, after Buladi came, it went up to 90%. They know about HIV AIDS, but they don't know how to, and Buladi says, use condom, prevent AIDS. But they know how, the words, but they don't know how to. So it was really important that um, uh, the community workers felt that this information will be coming in. They were so excited about it. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna talk a very little bit about the context of uh, the work that we do at Spark, though unfortunately the images that you will see will provide much more of the context than what I could ever actually share with you today. Um, so the core issue that we believe is really the most vital and dangerous issue that girls are dealing with worldwide is the issue of sexualization and has really become the rallying cry to the future of the feminist movement and young women and particularly girl activists and and girl organizers. So sexualization is the idea that value comes only from um, from your sexual appeal and your sexual behavior at the exclusion of all other attributes and qualities like strength and intellect and creativity and generosity, agency. And when the world around us is drowning us in these images, which we are literally now drowning in these images, this becomes normalized. This is how girls are supposed to look and supposed to act. And the girls even begin to embody it. Rates of sexual assault, sexual harassment, violence increase when girls are seen as sex objects. If we portray girls as sex objects, then we also as a community treat girls as, as sex objects. Um, so the American Psychological Association released a report in 2007 that was then revised in 2010 that really provided an unbelievable wealth of empirical evidence of the impact of sexualization and sexualized images on girls themselves and found um, not so shocking but really, really troubling and horrible that across the board, sexualization is impacting girls' mental health, self-esteem, um, eating disorders, depression, academic achievement, positive relationships, um, and their hope for the future. It's literally affecting the way they see themselves growing into women when they are completely surrounded by sexualized, I see everybody's jaws are just dropping as I'm speaking, <laughs> sexualized images. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my journey into this work and then the actual work that Spark is doing. So my background way long ago when I was a teenage girl, um, so I wanted to be an actor and I was very, very active in theater in my high school. And I was always in these plays. The plays were written by men and they were directed by the male teachers and felt like I had no voice in what I wanted to be creating. It was always speaking somebody else's words and being told by somebody else how you're supposed to move and how you're supposed to act. And years later, um, I started an organization where I work with teenage girls and they write and perform original plays in their own voices where they are literally performing their own stories and began to see that what we need to do as a way to solve this crisis is to actually bring girls into the movement. That we need to not stop but shift the focus on protecting girls from the problem and actually start empowering girls to be part of the solution. And that's what Spark is about. So we are what we call a girl-fueled movement. So we gain our energy at, from the girls themselves. We work with teenage girls uh, between the ages of about 13 and 22 all over the country and we're beginning an expansion globally as well and really bringing girls voices and girls actions and girls ideas and creativity into the movement to end the sexualization of girls. Um, that includes various programs and projects that we have going on at Spark. We're also a brand new organization. We're less than a year old and yet already have built an amazing network of girls around the country that are blogging for us twice a month about these issues 
issues. We're creating girl activist toolkits that can be used nationwide by organizations that work with girls as a way for girls to understand what it means to challenge the media, to challenge their education systems, to challenge the ways that they're portrayed and to actually create their own media as well. So instead of just complaining about the world actually making a difference and creating the world that they want to live in. Dana, you had two minutes more. Um, anyway, um, we're, we are now going to move to take a few minutes just among ourselves to um, give an opportunity to the panelists to ask each other any questions that they may have. If not, we'll move to the audience, or I may have a few questions that I can uh, stimulate you with. But um, does anyone want to make a comment, comments or, or question each other? I, I do, for Rada, uh, and <laughs> uh, I was wondering what was the collaboration like with Israeli women and uh, Arab women? What would you like to, to uh, know? <laughs> whatever you want to tell us. Uh, I think it's um, our collaboration um, <laughs> Just give me one second, no, okay? Be clear that we know what the question is. You, you're asking about the collaboration in the creation of... Right, uh, right. When they I just also wanted Obos? to know if, if be, it, it goes beyond, uh, beyond the creation of uh, mm. the book. First of all, for all of us as the women, in spite of being Jews, Palestinian, Christian, Muslim, it was really a dream to have this kind of book in the in uh, this kind of uh, complicated place that I mentioned. For me and for Dana to be a woman in this kind of situation of uh, this kind of political situation, it's not uh, easy at all. Because I said, because I, I said. Uh, when in Israel, uh, the, I think the most of uh, the resources are going for the security and less for uh, in doing uh, social change, not only for women, for others, other uh, uh, issues. Uh, and for us, it, it, it really was a dream because I, I began uh, to be part of uh, women and their bodies in Israel uh, almost before four years. They began before I, uh, I be, become to be a part. And that was uh, our vision. Uh, this was our uh, uh, aim. First of all, to begin together to write these two books, it was very obviously for both of us that we need one in Arabic, one in book, and not translated uh, books. It's uh, two books that's talking the history, the status of each of us, uh, the, Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian women in Israel and also uh, 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 the Jewish uh, women in Israel. It's not that so uh, romantic uh, uh, process only that we work together. It's also we have many, many challenges and many, uh, many uh, um, um, difficulties in our way. Someone, me, sometimes me and Dana and, uh, and part of the other staff, we didn't agree uh, about everything, but we're trying to find the way that I can put and I can put my beliefs, my agenda as a Palestinian in Israel, and also at the same time, how I can able to hear and to know what's going with Dana and the other staff that uh, we are both a gender minority in, in this place, in this very hard political uh, area in Israel. Others may, uh, that have produced the Obos books, what, um, what difficulties did you face? What, uh, maybe a few brief comments about, about that, the strategy around um, about the adapting strategy the Obos books? About the Obos. We knew a long time ago that Obos exists, and our dream was just to have it to translate it, but 
uh, accept enthusiasm, the goodwill, and our really, really enormous uh, energy to do something within an, uh, anything. We hadn't had anything. But uh, thanks to Ovos, we obtained copyrights, which was the first step in working with, uh, to start to work. Then we said, okay, we, don't, we have the copyrights now, but we don't have money to pay for the translation. And the strategy was not that we, have, uh, that we give the text and the book to the professional translator or interpreter, but we really wanted to, to give um, our, our um, part in, uh, in making the book. And that's why we uh, decided without any money, without, only with, <laughs> with goodwill and the copyrights, which, is, which was really a big deal, to, to start translating. And we divided among us, there was 11 women working on it, uh, chapters to see what we are going to do. Then we occasionally first, but then regularly started to, to examine what we did and how we are going, what will be the approach except of the translation. And then we decided to adapt it to, to be our version of, I mean Serbian version of um, the book and not just the book, but the first text in our language who is, who is approaching women, who gives them and uh, gives them knowledge, gives them strength to uh, see, uh, to see and to, to, to um, recognize their bodies, their health and their existence as, as a human beings. That was this. So, so we. It goes way beyond the book. Obviously. Yes, and we were. We had our. I said yesterday or the day before that we had our hands, our minds, our computers, and our goodwill to do it. So we edited, we uh, published it, we distributed it, and working everything on it. And uh, unfortunately. Uh, co caused by the lack of financial um, resources, uh, we made this e-version on our website, so it is accessible to the women like this, and they can use it. So that that's a step forward in in the dissemination of the book and the possibilities for the women to have it. Yes, I, uh, Stanislav, I wanted to ask you, because our books came out pretty much at the same time 10 years ago, how have, do you feel that your challenges have changed during these 10 years and the, if you were to do another edition, what uh, changes would be reflected in that? Do you well, we, uh, having a book, we had a strong tool, I don't like this, this word for, for, for the book, especially for, for our bodies, ourselves, because it's more, really more than a book, more than a tool, but the way of the approach to the women, to, to the life, to the, the existence of women and men and at the same time. So we uh, had uh, uh, our bodies, ourselves, uh, meant to us the basis for our development and for the further work. So we developed uh, it and the impact of, of the book and the impact of our activities uh, done during the promotion and during the dissemination of the book helped us to to, pro, to make the, the new profile of, of the organization uh, and uh, to, to start working on women's health really systematically, trying to have um, various levels of the approach. That means to involve, first of all, women, 
regarding their needs and their, their uh, formulation of the good health and the good policies toward the good health on one hand. On the other hand, we had a big task to lobby the government who was not very, very open to, to the issue <laughs> because uh, in our country, in my country, uh, uh, health is health, no matter uh, whether it's a man or a woman. Well, woman is recognized in this reproductive period as a, as a mother, but nothing else and nothing more, you know. And I have to, to so that's why we tried to, to make, and, and, the, and the third level, that was the, the general public and very, very important uh, segment of everything because uh, we think that the, uh, the, the general opinion should, uh, should um, change. That, that's all. Yes, I thought I'd just check to see if there are any more comments from the panel. And then we'll turn to the audience. Thank you very much. And I'm going to keep about five minutes at the end because I have another question that I want to pose. Uh, Shamita, did you want to make no. a comment? Why no? Just... We're all set? Well, then we'll open it up to people. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we'll just go back and forth. Are you... Oh, yes, we have a request. Let, uh, would you identify yourself and also speak slowly and clearly? Thank you. My name's Tyler Heron, and I would love to ask all of you a lot more questions, but I was curious to have, and thank you so much for all sharing all this amazing work that you're doing with women all over the globe. I wanted to ask Dana, though, if she could speak a little bit more around the organizing that you're doing with young teenagers, you know, because I do think that uh, it's a really vulnerable population that also has an amazing amount of energy and strength, and I think they're getting, you know, I, I'm just curious if you could walk us through a little bit more specifically some of the organizing work that you're doing with the youth. Thank you. And while Dana is answering, I urge you to, uh, you, those of you who have questions, to find yourself behind a microphone. Thanks. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, I completely agree with you that the, the future of all of this work is really training and helping and inspiring the young girls of today to really see this as um, the necessary work of the future. And so the, the work that we're doing with Spark, we are first of all, we're connecting with girls where they are, which mostly right now is online and through social networking across the country. So we have a very active um, online, iChat, social networking, Facebook interactions with girls. We have a, a couple different different teams of girls that we're working with across the country to really build the movement. Um, we have a group of girl bloggers, so we've got about 20 girls right now from all over the country representing different regions, and they are blogging with us twice a month about issues that they're noticing in their communities, issues that are arising in the media, and using um, our blog space is also a space for them to work through what these issues are and then sharing their blogs with each other. We iChat every week with them so that they're building a community online to understand uh, and get inspired by each other. Next weekend in New York City, we're having a girls activist training for 15 of the girls from all over the country. We're bringing to New York City and they're participating in three full days of girls activist training, which includes things like um, different writing workshops, also understanding the history of the feminist movement. So a lot of them are coming at this work not necessarily knowing the successes <coughs> and the challenges that we've experienced over the last couple hundred years in this country and also worldwide so that we're not repeating uh, mistakes and we are learning from the history of the movement. A lot of the girls come in thinking, first of all, I, I'm not a feminist, I don't like feminism, to also, I thought, you know, I thought we figured that out in the 70s, I thought we fixed those things. And so one thing that we're noticing with girls is to really work with them individually and and um, very personally about empowering themselves to really understand the ways that media is impacting them. And that's really the core aha moment that if we can get every girl and boy in this country to really see the ways, the manipulative ways that media is creating false images of what it means to grow up into a healthy woman uh, and challenge them on those. So really get them to break apart advertisements, to really think about television shows, media images, and how those things are created, why they're created, and how they can actually 
actually participate in remaking them and changing them. We, we do a lot of video mashing work where they are literally pulling apart commercials, understanding how they're made and thinking about ways that they can say to the corporations, you know, if you're selling sex and we're not buying it, this is what we're going to buy. And you have... You have <laughs> um, and I would love to hear from the rest of the website. panel. Yes, and we have a website, sparkmovement.org. So spark a change, join the movement, join our Facebook page, send us emails. Um, we're also creating what we're calling spark summits across the country. So spark summits are ways for organizations to actually create one day girls activist trainings. And we're providing toolkits for these organizations to actually use this, the, um, the activities that we've been building at their home sites. So we're not, I'm in New York, so we're sort of based in New York, but we're really nationwide and we're growing globally as well. So it's thrilling to see what's happening in other parts of the world, and we'd love to connect with all of you. Does anyone else want to comment on this question of working with young women? No? We'll go to the next question then. Go ahead. Well, thank you so much. Come to Holland also, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Marlies Bosch from the Netherlands, and uh, I'm not only a photographer, but I'm also a healthcare worker for like 25 years. And I just wanted to I'm going to end with a question, but I want to say that uh, in 1995 I, I got to know Tibetan Buddhist nuns in Ladakh and in Nepal, and since then I've been working with them with healthcare issues, and at a certain point I decided that they really didn't know anything about their bodies, so I contacted Obos, uh, Sally and, and Norma, and uh, we, we, I got all the chapters, and I started to get the Tibetan version actually ready, and that came out a couple of years ago. And right now, I'm in the middle of the second edition, actually. And we got a sponsor from Singapore. And here comes the problem. The first edition was accidentally uh, printed in two parts because the reproductive part and the part about sexuality was left out. <laughs> and uh, it was just like they, they told us it was an accident, but it was meant for <laughs> Buddhist nuns. And Buddhist <laughs> nuns are supposed not to be celibate and not know anything about sexuality. So, and also the part about lesbian love was left out because they told us why nuns, you know, they can't be lesbians, they're celibate. So then I found out in, in, when I saw the nuns being so close and intimate together, and somebody said to me, well, if you leave it out, then the nuns won't know that if they go any further than just hugging, it will be sexu sexual misconduct. So just leave them, not knowing it, and then they can just enjoy themselves. <laughs> So we did, but now comes the problem. We found a Singaporean sponsor to pay for the second edition, and they insist on not printing the part about uh, sexuality and reproductive health. And so we're going to accept it because you know it's hap we're happy that they do print the other part. But we're looking. F so how do you deal with that? I mean, it's it's like a real issue, and maybe. Uh, Shamita, you're from India, so you know the, more about the culture than I probably do, <laughs> although I've been coming there a lot of times. Could you or anybody else give an answer sure. to that? Sure. Um, and uh, our, uh, the book that we did, transcreated it, uh, it's called Amar Shastu, Amar Shatta, meaning my health, my soul. Uh, and it, did, it does have, it includes... Um, sexuality and in fact we didn't have money to do the whole book so we did only two chapters one is sexuality one is taking care of ourselves and the sex this sexuality part and also um, uh, same-sex love uh, and it, it's definitely you know feature featured in it and uh, by the way it's the first time you know people came and said this is the first time we are seeing in a book same-sex love or lesbianism being mentioned um, it, you know, uh, from, the, from the women and girls, we had tremendous acceptance. They were absolutely delighted that it's there. Whether and we asked them directly, is it going to cause you trouble? And some of the women did say that, yes, if I take it home, it's going to cause trouble. Um, but I don't care. Okay. I'm going to, and many of them were, you know, pretty strong and said, I don't care, I'm going to take it home. I'm going to, if need be, I'll hide it in whatever cubbyhole I can find, but I am so glad you're doing it. So we did that, and, uh, uh, but the main resistance came from, I would say, the powers that be, the local political 
officers uh, who were basically saying we are corrupting the women, and these are all young men and men as such, older men and younger men, and also that this is all imported from Western ideas imported, so that was a big thing. But the women and girls were absolutely, you know, ready to fight for it and have it there. So I would think that once you put it in, I'm sure there's going to be resistance and there's going to be trouble. But uh, it, you might find the women ready to take it on. Yeah. Well, maybe we just sh should find another sponsor to do the second part and then give it to the nuns anyway. So. <laughs> Let's, um, right. let's move to the next question over here and here, and then we'll come to you. Thank you, because these women have been waiting. Hi, my name is Sarah Azam, and I just want to start by thanking Dana Edel. I'm the mother of a teenage girl. And so, um, you know, we are constantly fighting between ourselves as well as with the media about the images that are presented towards teenage girls in the United States today. Um, and to Ragda, um, I married into a Palestinian family, and um, I think the entire Obos project is a really great example of what happens when you put a bunch of women into a room, because we always get things done. But I think that you and the other Dana, who I think must be over here somewhere, had an amazing job and an amazing challenge to meet, and thank you for meeting it. Hi, my name is Michelle Prague. My question is, how did your work with Obos affect your religious beliefs, and how did you, your religion affect how you addressed uh, women's sexuality? And the second part to the question, how did your work affect the greater religious community in which you were brought up and worked in? And you're addressing that to? Um, Especially to Ragda and uh, how do you say your name? I'm Maybe. sorry, Maybe. Stanislava. So, do you think only the Palestinian community is very religious? Or no, no, I, no. I, I, I was asking I, everybody. I would like to, uh, I'm really. I want to understand if you can explain for me what's your question exactly. Because religion. I'm, I I study not cultural only anthropology. On my society. I study cultural anthropology, so I was just interested as a whole for everybody how their religion navigated their uh, role in human sexuality and their reasoning for taking upon this type of study and bringing it back into their community and how their community, religious community here in the U.S., we have parts that are very contentious with this area. If you go to the south or the Midwest, they're not very happy whereas other parts are very liberal. So how, were the, how was it received? How were you, how did you receive it? Um, I think uh, uh, the, Arab, uh, the Arab women face uh, the same processes that other women in the world facing uh, about uh, issues and topics uh, uh, which talks about body, sexuality, and, uh, and health. But I, th I think the context is different. Okay. And our status is different. And uh, just before I, I um, came to the panel, I talked uh, with some of uh, uh, my colleagues here, and I told them, because I'm so involved uh, in the uh, Palestinian political feminist in, in movement in, in Israel and also in the West Bank, and I, wrote, I read a lot about what's happened to the Palestinian women before 48 and after 48, after the establishment of, uh, of Israel, and uh, we recognized that um, the status of Palestinian uh, women uh, in regress after uh, uh, the establishment of uh, uh, Israel. Because before 48, uh, women were more empowered. We have more opportunities to work, uh, more educated, uh, and the society was, our society was, were more open-minded 
to uh, to uh, the status of uh, of women and uh, it's uh, 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 and its place in the family in the community in the society and after 48 when i i said 48 i said uh, i mean the established of uh, of israel the nakba of the palestinian uh, uh, the palestinian family became to be more afraid about the status of the woman mm -hmm. uh, the honor be, uh, uh, take more place because uh, they are afraid of our uh, mixed with uh, the Jews, with the European, and also not become like them and lost our tradition, our norms. And so the society became more harder with us as a woman, not because she was like that, okay? But because all the uh, uh, hard political context, and uh, also we see that after 67, there is a huge, big uh, uh, feminist movement inside Israel that works with the Jewish women also, work with the uh, uh, Jew Jewish uh, movement to do and uh, uh, to put a new agenda about what the meaning of political feminist uh, 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 perspective for us together and, uh, and try to delete the, all the stereotype of, uh, of us as, uh, as Arab uh, in many places in the world. Okay. I hope that I was uh, yes, yes. so clearly. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to have two more questions over here and then I want to turn back to the panel. Yes, my name is Maymay Ellerman. I'm on the board of directors of the Polaris Project, which is one of the leading anti-human trafficking and modern-day slavery organizations here in the U.S. and in Japan. And uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for the amazing work that they're doing uh, across the world. I'm addressing my remarks especially to Dana because we are seeing day, every single day the effects of the media uh, on young women and men. And first of all, I think that the work that you're doing is absolutely amazing. It is what is needed because even by the time children are on fifth, sixth, seventh grade, they are, they're, their mindsets, both the, the, both the girls and the boys, are so influenced by the media, by the glamorization of pimpdom, by the glamorization of prostitution and just the female body as a sexual commodity, that it makes them increasingly uh, vulnerable to becoming victims of sex trafficking. I don't know whether you know, but in the United States alone, between 1.6 and 2.8 million minors, these are American kids, run away from home every single year. And between one point <coughs> One out of four, one out of six of these children will be picked up by a pimp and will end up in forced commercial sexual exploitation within 48 hours. So the, 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 the numbers are just staggering. And when, when, when one thinks of human trafficking in the US, most people think of foreign nationals. But it is our own citizens, our own kids, who, are, who, who constitute the largest number of the victims. So what you are doing is amazing. I really want to get in touch with you. And I hope that there's going to be um, an equivalent male organization that just springs up because we need to work with the boys as much as we need to work with the girls because it's the it's a mindset that's formed when kids male kids age 11 start looking at the internet at hardcore pornography or what i would consider from my generation hardcore pornography so thank you very much and i hope that maybe uh, among your colleagues on the male side there's somebody who's going to be equally inspired and have the same fight the same fire in the belly so that we can really start working from a basis of gender equality and neutralizing the, the noxious effect of our media today. Thank you very much. Um, so my question is for anyone who wants to answer on the panel, really. A lot of you focused on violence against women, and that's an issue that I'm very passionate about um, and something I work in my professional life. So I was wondering, um, how do you feel our bodies ourselves can be used as a way 
to combat domestic violence, rape, sexual assault throughout the world? And do you think that it is, I know someone used the word tool and thinks that it's not just a book, and it's obviously not just a book. So how do you use it to combat violence against women? For anyone who speaks that. Who would like to address that question? Mm -hmm. Shamita? Yeah, Shamita has worked uh, directly on right. yes. issues of violence uh, against women. I think for women to do, you know, to do things, uh, and also the male part, I'm just look, focusing on women now, um, one is to be empowered to resist and to seek help, both sides. Um, you need information, you need community support, and uh, you need technology. Uh, in some ways, to do all, th you know, to, to both of these things, and um, part the the opus part is to do exactly that, to provide all of these pieces, and it's not just the women, but also the community. You know, the, the best in the best situation, you would know, you would have the community read this, you would have the community understand what violence would mean to women, and how, you know, what happens to them. Because in many of our communities, women are not supposed to speak about it when happen, violence when it happens to them. So um, it opens up many, many, many layered doors, quite frankly. And on the other side, when men get to hear this, and I heard two wonderful young men in the morning talk about how their mothers have changed their lives. And if it, that could happen to every man, uh, we would see this kind of a ripple effect uh, that, that wouldn't need, you know, that would make our work obsolete, frankly. So I would see that happening. Thank you very much. That's a great answer. Well, I see we have one more question. If you could be brief, I want to take the uh, privilege of being moderator to offer one more question myself. So yeah. go ahead. Um, I just have a quick question for Shmita. Um, especially working in like a post-colonial context, how do you present the information to women in a way that doesn't kind of, it's not just perceived as this is only specific to Western women, but it's just a women's health initiative? Like, how do you present the information as being kind of like a global context? Um, I think it has to be community specific. In, my, in the case that we worked on, Shonglap and uh, our organization, Mani, we worked on, um, we actually, if you, and, and that's one of the reasons I keep saying it's trans creation rather than translation, uh, is because we took the topics, uh, but the content was completely changed and it became culturally appropriate. Um, if you look at the uh, book and if you could read it, uh, it, it has, the content is absolutely specific for um, Bengalis, Bangalis, uh, and in, in that particular context. And, uh, you know, we had to look at, in, in um, Bengal, uh, race may not be as important, but classes. So we had to insert that, and we had to talk about different things available, affordable, appropriate in different classes. So it was a much more complex, in, from my point of view, it's a very complex way of weaving what is happening, um, uh, and the information, and make it, making it uh, uh, available and accessible to women. So that was, that was part of the work and I think it's really important. And I truly think nothing can be global and you know, if you have one thing, it doesn't fit all, one size doesn't fit all. You have to make it much more specific. Um, so uh, to me that was important. And I think um, you know, in our community, particularly in West Bengal, many of the women can't read. So we had to make sure that there were lots of pictures, uh, drawings, um, sketches, and it had to go to uh, the community workers who were already uh, working uh, with women. So it went to them, uh, and they are the ones who may be reading it, working with women and uh, giving that information. And just before I came, and I have to say this, I heard that there's an effort going on to get the book um, uh, included in uh, school curriculum. So I'm very happy about that. I hope it works. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm, I, I have to cut, so. um, I, I just wanted to add a little bit about um, how important this work is and this book is 
uh, in situations that the violence is not explicit, um, but maybe m more hidden or more in invisible or oppression or injustice that that's, uh, of course in Bulgaria we have uh, organizations that work with domestic violence, with trafficking, and I'm, I'm hoping um, the book, they're finding the book useful. Um, but what uh, another thing that we're working on is, for example, ag again, just to say a little bit about the background. So after 1989, what was a system of socialized medicine, you know, free at the point of use for everybody, um, however, quite hierarchical, paternalistically organized, uh, rapidly turned into a, a, a very different system. Uh, so this collective state responsibility that was there, that was part of you know, everybody's approach to medicine, all of a sudden dissolved and uh, it became uh, more privatized, decentralized, um, you know, a lot of you know, transformations, insurance-based later on. But what what that uh, led to is this more, um, you know, discourse of individual responsibility for one's health. And what that, we know that leads to is a lot of blame. And, uh, and while, you know, health deteriorated for everyone, I think the blame was directed ex much more uh, to women. Blame for not sustaining health or blame for not um, knowing how to treat themselves, blame at um, by you know at at their point of uh, uh, interaction with with uh, the medical system, um, and that is I think one one way in which the book has been very useful to kind of balance that. Um, or, or to embrace both the individual responsibility and empowerment through knowledge and through information, but also awareness of these uh, structural barriers that um, not every individual is responsible for, but collectively can be addressed and um, discussed and changed. Okay, um, thank you. I, I'm. I'm uh, going to take the prerogative of moderator and just uh, allow myself one question here. But I, I wanted to say that I, I teach at Stanford University on women's health and human rights. And we go through the quarter talking about these horrendous and outrageous issues that w have been raised here and that m many of us in this room work on if it isn't, uh, you know, uh, sex selective abortion or female infanticide or what, all the way through to aging. Um, with centered at the at the at the middle of the class, and I think in our discussions, the issue that we just came up: violence against women, violence, the many violences against women. And in my class, I often have to stop at about the fifth or sixth week and say, "What do we do? What makes us feel hopeful? We are working on such difficult, such outrageous issues. Uh, let's stop and think about the the event, the happening." Uh, the publication of the new version of Obos, whatever it might be. Judy reminds me of the White Ribbon Campaign uh, for Men, which is uh, uh, an organization and a campaign, uh, as I understand it, uh, of, of men who, are, uh, who don't want to be associated with, <laughs> with violence against women and want to work against it. So I would put to the panel, and now thinking on your feet, um, a happening, an event, uh, um, something that makes you feel hopeful, makes you feel um, inspired and strengthened. Um, and I'd like to end with that, if, we can, if I can put you on the spot and ask you uh, what comes to your mind as something that has inspired you, has made you feel that, that uh, all's well with the world. And you don't have to go in any order. I think that uh, women and their bodies now have the two books, the Arabic and the Hebrew books, and they are out. It's, uh, I, I think it was a gift for my birthday, last birthday at August. I think uh, this is what uh, gave me uh, a pleasure, a hopeful uh, happiness, uh, and that our vision became uh, a, a reality. Yeah. Tremendous, I, I think a tremendously significant uh, event, definitely. Congratulations. Yeah. 
Okay, the inspiration is great and the success is an accomplishment until now, since we published the book in 2001, we're enormous and we are really proud of being a visionary to translate the book and to have the text and to have, uh, not a tool, but the, 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 the essence of women's lives on which we can build our philosophy for further development. And we did it, really, we did it. And think, of course, we are not satisfied. There is so many things to do. And so many things are not depending on, the, on us, but are still our matters and women's matters as well. So we have to do a lot of things, but I think that our vision in, and our mission at this moment is to put all our efforts, and we are putting them to translate the, the gender perspective and the gender analysis into the women's health and the relationships and to build the more just uh, society according to the women's human rights, but based on the equality and equity. That's what we are doing and that's how our efforts are put in, in this moment. Of course, we try to, to educate, we try to, to make the researches, to, to lobby and to um, cooperate with the authorities because without them, unfortunately, there will be only a nice story, but without the happy end. <laughs> uh, I, I also have to say that the fact that we got the book published was a big success. It, it was 10 years ago, but, um, and the fact that we were able to get it out there um, without um, making the compromises that the publisher wanted us to make, uh, I think, <laughs> um, maybe 99%, but um, there was a lot of pressure to obviously, um, you know, tone down the political, uh, message of the book to eliminate some of the chapters or some of the passages on the sexuality. We've kept all that. Uh, there was pressure to just make it. Actually, they wanted to call us Encyclopedia of Women's Health and have a <laughs> and have a red apple um, on the cover. Uh, so th th that that w is a, a success, I think. You know having it out there uh, in this uh, way, though, um, though there's, again, as Stanislav says, there's a lot more to do in that sense. And, and the other success, I think, is as these, the years have gone by, um, we initially wanted to emphasize um, <coughs> empowerment of individual women or smaller groups of women. Um, and our translator, excellent translator, uh, Cornelia Slavova, some of you have met her at other meetings. Uh, she was really very sensitive to the language of this uh, language of um, individual empowerment or small group empowerment and also collective empowerment and how that sounds uh, in post-socialist times, <laughs> right? To, to have a new language for this, for a similar message of collectivity. And um, we were, I think, you know, managed to get that, to have that happen in the language, but uh, since then the collective aspect of um, health rights has expanded and now there are a lot more movements of patient organizations and other women's groups in that direction. So that I think is, I can't, you know, point causality exactly, but, um, you know, I think it's part of the whole phenomenon. Um, for me, there's so much going on, uh, so, many, so much act, act, activism going on, it's exciting. But I have to tell you a story. Uh, when, while I was consulting and collecting stories for um, Amar Shastu, the um, Obos book, uh, I came across, and I was telling Anne about this, a group of um, young girls between 14 and about 20, um, in, in a, a 
totally Muslim community, uh, very, very poor. Uh, they were mainly tailors. Um, the, the men were mainly tailors in that village. And this group of uh, young women uh, have become entrepreneurs. And uh, what was happening is they realized, uh, or, or one of the uh, older women realized that they, um, many of the women in the village were getting um, infections because they because of the unsanitary condition they were having their menstrual pads they were washing it in secret and you know not really cleaning it properly they were hiding it in the cow sheds uh, and it was just really bad and the infection rate was very high so she started um, thinking about it and was was, talk, was she started talking to the young girls and most of the young girls in that village got married by the time they were 14 so these kids, uh, these young girls who didn't want to marry, decided they have to do something about it. So 50 of them have now become trained in making sanitary napkins. And uh, they are, it's an amazing, I ha have that story in the book. And uh, it was just, uh, in, a, in a village where you can't even speak about it, they have become trained. They uh, applied for, and this is 14-year-olds, um, they applied for a machine, uh, to buy a machine, um, from the, from a, applied for a loan from the bank, they bought a machine. They started a production company of sanitary napkins that they are giving and selling to the villagers, village women. And, and there um, is whatever you can give at this point, but if you don't have any money, we'll give it to you free. And the infection rate is dropping in that uh, village. And I asked them, and these were, you know, you have a picture, by the way. You saw a picture of them. And I asked the girls, what do you want to do? What's your um, uh, ambition? And they said, uh, well, we want to sell it to whole of West Bengal and then India and internationally. We are all, <laughs> yeah. And they were like, we are all going to become entrepreneurs and we are not going to marry because when we bring in, bring in income into our homes, then our parents don't pressure us to get married. So this is a great, you know, am amazing group of women. And they make me hopeful. Um, I'll tell a little story of uh, a great success that Spark had a week ago, very recently. Um, there was a Halloweenstores.com, which is the largest, one of the largest Halloween retailers, yes, not, not a very great corporation, had a Halloween costume that was a bestseller Halloween costume that was um, a very sexy, very uh, low-cut, mini-skirt, black dress with a skeleton on it, a white skeleton, and there was a sash that went around it that had a measuring tape. And the name of the costume was Anorexia. And we saw the image, Huffington posted, there, it got a little bit of press. It was on the homepage of, I think, Halloweenstores.com as one of their Halloween costumes that you could buy. And so we launched your petition immediately and sent it out to all of our girls and said, post this on your Facebook page, tweet it out, um, put it on the Tumblr, get it out immediately. We need, uh, we need a lot of energy behind this. Within about an hour, we had almost 300 signatures um, from girls and women and men all over the country and sent an email to the CEO of Halloweenstores.com saying, um, we, you need to remove this costume immediately and, and we're all telling you to do this now. And within minutes, I think, of that email, um, one of the employees of HalloweenStores.com sent me an email that said, we have removed the costume from um, our website. And I emailed back and said, yeah, even better, even better, and said, uh, write me a statement that says you will, and he said, take down your petition immediately. So he knew, he was very, very nervous about this petition being online because also in the language of the petition said, you know, Halloweenstores.com is one of the biggest family <laughs> Halloween costume stores. They really rely on, for their business, all these children's Halloween costumes, parents buying costumes for their kids. In the language of the petition, it said, you know, the leading cause of death for girls in America ages 15 to 24 is anorexia. So he got scared. I said, you, you have to make sure that... Um, write me a statement that says you will never sell this costume again and you will remove it from all of your physical stores. Again, within minutes, he sent me that email that says we will um, never sell this costume again. So, <laughs> but what was amazingly, um, 
exciting and empowering about it is that the girls were involved with this. Like this was such a tangible success of how their voices made a difference, immediately made a difference, and that we are using media. We are challenging media with media. So within a couple of hours, an online petition actually caused change in a major corporation. So it's very exciting. And now, um, now D Dana and I chatted, and I said, "Now can you get down those other costumes that are so damn?" <laughs> And, and incidentally, ask this company for a donation to your organization. Um, anyway, um, we have to close, unfortunately. This has been very interesting and I think inspiring. I would say a panel and meeting and hearing about your work is, um, is always uh, in, uh, energizing and strengthening to me. So thank you, Rada. Thank you, Stanislava. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Shamita. Thank you.